Chapter 2, Explanatory Notes by Mohammed Rahim Bawa Mohayedin, Explanations Arising from Wisdom Born of Experience, Secrets Contained Within Man's Body. Only God will know the glory of God. Only God will know his power and his creation. Amin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, most merciful, most compassionate. The Kamal Sheikh gives explanations of wisdom to his children by showing them examples that illustrate an underlying principle, helps them to perceive the truth within that basic principle, and explains and reveals to them that which stands resplending within that truth, the infinite omnipresence, the sustainer of both worlds, that which resonates, pulsates, and resplends everywhere, permeating all of everything as the undiminishing plenitude of perfection, as the anathi and the athi, as the imperishable, eternal, all-pervasive effulgence of perfection. Children, the disciplines that have to be followed and the conditions that have to be fulfilled by you must not only be learned, understood, and acted upon with clarity, they must also be experienced. Only then will the wisdom capable of distinguishing joy from sorrow, good from evil, and real from unreal manifest within you. On the other hand, speech that lacks the wisdom of experience, actions that lack the wisdom of experience, study and learning that lack the wisdom of experience, and work that lacks the wisdom of experience, all these, much like the scenes seen by your physical eyes, will be mere illustrations if you scrutinize all these carefully, recognize how their qualities and actions form, realize their good and evil effects, and experience those effects, and if through that experience, wisdom dawns shining and resplendent within you, resonating, pulsating, and explaining, that will be the most excellent understanding for you the understanding born of experience. Only after this happens will you be able to realize and acquire the truth that must be known by you, and thus reach the station that must be attained by you. But in order for you to reach that state, the divine analytic wisdom, pahuth arivu, and divine luminous wisdom, per arivu, of truth must dawn, resonate, and resplend within you. It is in that state and with this wisdom that you must attempt to understand this book called The Resonance of Allah, Resplendent Explanations, Issuing from the Nur, the Wisdom of Allah's Grace. To acquire this understanding, you must first break open the gates that you have closed so securely, the gates of the arrogance born out of the festering sore of your religious bigotry. After that, if you come out from behind the enveloping veils of the mind and stand in the light that is the infinite, wide open space, and then read this book, all secrets, inner and outer, will be revealed. When you are in this state, children, you will understand with wisdom that all the outer secrets, the visions we see with our eyes, the tastes we experience with our senses, and the forms of darkness within our mind are perishable things, forms belonging to the darkness of illusion, or maya, once you have realized that these forms, which are impermanent, are mere examples drawn from this present era, 
if you push away these external things, which are only examples, identify the fundamental principle underlying them, extract the reality within that principle, and then, if, falling into the effulgent treasure of bliss within that reality, you mingle and merge and subside within it, that will be the most exalted understanding born of wisdom. Only if you are in that state when you read this book can you know and understand its inner and outer meanings. If, however, you view it from within the confines of the gates of bigotry, it will be very difficult for you to understand these meanings. For while you are busily occupied looking for all the things you have accumulated from this world and stacked up within the very house you have built, you will not search for that undiminishing treasure which is the fullness everywhere. But if you reflect upon this and realize it, make your wisdom radiant, make it resonate within you, and, leaving behind all the things you have accumulated, open those gates and come out as a free being and search, then you will be able to discover that one treasure, a magnificent effulgence, which is undiminishing plenitude incomparable and everlasting. I swear to the truth of this. Realize this and know and understand it. This alone will give you wisdom, discernment, attainment, and liberation in this birth. Children, once all the examples disappear, the underlying principle will be seen. When the underlying principle disappears, the truth will be revealed. Then, if you make yourself small and subside within that truth, what is within will be God, nothing else. This realization will give you the happiness belonging to the state of blissful, resplendent wisdom. You must know this, my fellow beings, born as the human generation, as mankind, the most exalted life among God's creations. So says the Kamal Sheikh. Delicious fruits of my love. Let me give you an example. Fleas, mosquitoes, ticks, and other creatures that breed in dirty water and moist, decaying matter, in jungles and other such places, sting human beings, animals, and many other creations and drink their blood. When a mosquito is sucking the blood, if its host shakes or moves, the mosquito will give up its feeding and fly away to search for another host. As it flies around, it may be swatted and killed. Even if it succeeds in finding a new host to drink from, it may still be in danger, for if the new blood does not match the blood of the previous host, Toxins will be produced within the mosquito, causing its blood to clot, and as a result, it may die. However, there are some mosquitoes that, when they bite a host, become so entranced by the taste of that blood that they go on sucking, disregarding their very life. They lie mesmerized, without any thought of flying to other places to drink more blood. Such mosquitoes go on relishing the taste of that blood without concern for the safety of their own life. Like this, children, among the creations of Allahu Ta'ala Nayan, there are various scenes, patterns and colors, honors, titles, fame, positions, money, wealth, religions, castes, doctrines, and philosophies, Vedanta and Sitanta, Sarye, Kirye, Yogam and Jnanam, Shariat, Tarikat, Hakikat and Marifat, House, Property, 
and countless other pursuits that man falls into, and like the mosquito, bites a little here and a little there, and then starts fights, saying things like, what's mine is important, yours is worthless, my religion is better than yours. Thus he roams, forfeiting his wisdom and forfeiting the one, but still hopeful of realizing the truth, Nyanam, God, and himself, and of perfecting his wisdom and relieving the hunger of his birth. But the wisdom of the actions of such a man come from a heart filled with a darkness, even darker than that of our present time, the darkness that is the accumulation of the vast darkness of 800,000 million years. If he thinks he can discover the reality using that darkness, he will not succeed, not in this birth, nor in any birth. Furthermore, just as a mosquito that flies everywhere and sucks blood from several different creatures ends up dying from the poisonous effects of the mixed blood, this kind of man runs around believing that these things he sees with his mental and physical vision are worth being devoted to. Thus he clings to a variety of things, hoping to appease the spiritual hunger of this birth, until finally, unable to reach his goal, he succumbs and goes to his death. Children, this must be realized and understood. Truth is one. That one is God. We are God's creations. We come from the same original mother and father. Thus, we are all one family. Equality is our state. To accept the one reality, that treasure which shines eternally as truth, and to abide by that, is the true understanding of the wisdom of insan, or man. You must realize this, my children. This is what I ask of you. Only when this wisdom dawns in you, will you, through it, be able to understand and know this book. You cannot comprehend it through the understandings you have previously accumulated. Moreover, the teachings of God and his explanations of grace will keep coming regarding the future, the present, and the past, all three times. In order to know and understand these teachings, man needs this wisdom. He must use it to know and to understand. Like the mosquito that clings to its host, disregarding its very life, and bites, sucks, and drinks the blood until its stomach is full, then lies in that place completely entranced. If a man endowed with divine analytic wisdom, Pahuth Arivu, and divine luminous wisdom, Per Arivu, will fall within a sheikh, a spiritual guide or teacher, who is an insan kamal, a perfected man, and cling to him like glue, then bite, suck, and drink the truth that is within the sheikh, until his own wisdom is satiated, he too will lie entranced in that place, attain that treasure, and acquire its grace. Otherwise he will succumb and die, like a mosquito that flies from host to host. Therefore, if you find a true sheikh, you must hold on to him, suck the truth from him, drink that truth, and savor and relish its taste. Only then will your wisdom reach perfection. My children, I tell you this with certainty. All the areas to which a man roams in search of explanations turn out, in the end, to be merely things of hypnotic delusion, which take the form of darknesses that cloud and hide the truth. He sees them as gods, as friends, children, wife, property, wealth, house, learning, titles, fame, religions, paths, philosophies, high and low castes, and as countless acts of ignorance belonging to the realm of selfishness. 
All these plying men with ignorance, titles, and fame obscure his wisdom, exhibit darkness, fill his heart with taints and blemishes, chase away grace, conceal the inner reality, cast out the one and instead promote the two, earth and gold. In addition, they foster desire, propagate attachment, cause disunity in families, burn up wisdom, fill the mind with ignorance, show the way to the cemetery and crematorium, and provide men with the benefits of the vilest, deepest, and most disgusting of hells. You must realize that this is what such efforts will do for you. Children, knowing and understanding this, if one falls into a Kamal Sheikh, divinely wise spiritual teacher, drinks the truth, draws in the grace, fills himself with wisdom, dispels darkness, and sees only Allahu Ta'ala Nayan, that all-pervasive, omnipresent effulgence, the one who is the Anathi and the Ati, the beginningless one, and the one who is the primal beginning, if he sees only him within and without, clings to him, consumes the truth of his grace, and lies entranced by it, such a one will be an insan kamal, and his state will be dinal islam. Dinal islam is the pure resplendence that flourishes and radiates within patience. It is Allah's beauty of grace. Children, you must understand and realize this. God is one. Only when we see this one as the one that is everywhere in everything and making ourselves small, lose ourselves within the one, will the wisdom of grace dawn within us. Only if that wisdom emerges can we understand the meanings contained in this book. Therefore, you must draw forth that wisdom and use it. So says the Insan Kamal Sheikh to his children. The Kamal Sheikh is giving examples to illustrate the understandings he has gained during his inner experiences. If you want to learn these truths, you must leave behind all the things you have collected the bundles you have piled up, the evil darkness of the bondage of attachment that you are clinging to, the arrogant fanaticism that comes with deluded wisdom, mayakam, and the debasing false wisdom stemming from your ignorance, that enemy of wisdom that fosters discrimination between you and I. Only if you leave all these behind come out into that perfectly pure, wide open space, and then examine this book with the radiance of wisdom, will the meanings and truths within it be seen? Thus says the Kamal Sheikh, those who have attained this state must reflect upon and understand the significance of what I am about to explain. We who are man, in San, must investigate with the wisdom of truth. Who are we? Who is it that created us? When did we appear? When will we disappear? Man must realize who it was that appeared on this earth to discover and understand the answers to the above four questions. The Kamal Sheikh explains, you who have been born with me, that which created us resplends as a treasure that is one and only one. To the wisdom of perfect purity, that one is not hidden. It exists as the one, as the perfect completeness within all of everything. It is this treasure that formed us and kept us within it in anati before ati. Then, in the time of creation, it makes us emerge from it, exist in the present, and disappear in the hereafter. 
To come to know it, man must research with his divine analytic wisdom and understand with his divine luminous wisdom. Wisdom alone can know that treasure, nothing else can. As the wisdom of man ripens and matures, it becomes radiant. When that radiance expands and showers its brilliant rays, it becomes the light of divine wisdom, jnana jyoti. When that light of divine wisdom falls upon all of God's creations, extracts the truth that is in them, and savors the taste of that truth, it becomes the resplendence of the soul, atma jyoti. When that resplendence of the soul converses with God without any coming or going, it resplends as divine luminous wisdom, per arivu. When that resplendent divine luminous wisdom subsides and disappears within the source from which it emerged, it becomes the resplendence that is the nur, the light of Allah. When the nur, which is the light of 10 million resplendences, disappears into that from which it emerged, that omnipresent effulgence that fills all of everything in completeness and perfection, then the nur becomes Allah. This subsiding and disappearing of man's resplendent wisdom of truth into Allah is what is meant by tawhid, or oneness, merging without any trace of duality. To understand this state and to lose oneself in Allah and merge as one is the reason for and purpose of this birth as man. Please understand this, says the Kamal Sheikh to his children. Children, I will give you an example. You must analyze it and reflect upon it with divine analytic wisdom. Pahuth Arivu. There is a sun that your physical eyes can see. You see it rising in the eastern sky and setting in the western sky, do you not? This sky through which the sun travels is filled with natural objects that begin to glitter as soon as darkness sets in. Thus the moon, stars, and countless silvery lights and glitters stand shimmering in the night sky. But as soon as the sun rises and shines, dispelling the darkness, all those glitters disappear within its resplendence. Its brilliant rays fall upon this ball-like earth, enveloping it. Unable to overcome the brilliance of the sun's light, the glitters fade away, although the objects still remain. Now only the light of the sun is visible. Even if we should happen to catch a glimpse of the stars or the moon in the sunlit sky, they seem to have lost all their power. They lack the glittering brilliance they produced in the darkness. The sun emits its rays from 700 million miles above the earth. Scientific investigation reports this distance to be about 93 million miles. The moon, which lies between the two, shines from 7 million miles above the earth. Scientific investigation places this distance at about 239,000 miles. Even though the sun is much further from the earth, its resplendence is so great that it swallows the rays of the moon and all other objects in the sky, sending its rays beyond them all. Both the darkness, as well as the glitters from the celestial objects, disappear within the sun's brilliance. The light and energy of the moon are derived from the sun in the following way. Out in space, there is an acid layer 50,000 miles deep. The powerful rays of the sun fall into that acid belt, heating it up, and from there fall as a coppery acid emanation onto the moon, giving it its cool coppery color. For 14 days of the month, starting from the dark time of the moon, that acid layer heats up until it reaches its saturation point and boils over. 
During that time, the moon keeps drawing from the acid layer until it reaches maximum power when it resplends as the full moon. Then, for the next 14 days, the moon, hidden from the sun by the earth, gradually loses its power and wanes to become the half moon. The power of the moon dur during this waning period is absorbed every night in turn by the cluster of stars it falls upon. For example, when you switch on a powerful flashlight, the light goes out from the flashlight as a thin pointed beam. Only when the thin beam falls on an object does the light spread out, allowing us to see the object on which it fell. Objects outside its path, in the surrounding darkness, cannot be seen. Similarly, when the light of the moon falls on a particular star, only that star will be visible, while all the other stars remain invisible in the darkness. Thus, although the power of the moon passes across the 27 stars, each star is seen only when it is directly in the path of that light. Now, when the flashlight is switched off, the light beam that went out returns to the flashlight held in the hand. Similar to that is the power of the angels that emerge from Allah's essence, his thought. That power exists within his hand of grace. When he turns it on, the power flows out. When he turns it off, the power returns to his hand. My children, we mention this merely as an illustration. To continue, the light of the moon falls onto each of the stars, and from there that light falls into flowers, food, fragrances, seeds, and so on. It also falls into insan, or man, since he is composed of the 27 letters, or star clusters, and into the world and other elemental things around him, supplying energy to them all. You must reflect on this and understand it. In a similar way, the sun draws and extracts the rays of the resplendent power of the Nur, which are rays of God's grace, and beams them out to the stars and all around them, thus dispelling and cutting away the darknesses and evil forces. Man must understand these explanations about the sun and moon. The moon draws and extracts energy from objects of hypnotic delusion and makes it useful to man and the world, while the sun draws and extracts the resplendence from the nur and uses it as a radiant light for wisdom, truth, and jnanam, both on the inside and the outside. Further, there are 15 worlds within man and 15 worlds outside of him as well. They are two different types, like the sun and moon. Whatever appears within the mind, originating from desire, manifests on the outside as scenes seen by the physical eyes. When these visualizations of the mind encounter the darkness of illusion within man, they glitter in that darkness. But as soon as they encounter the resplendence of the resonance of jnanam, the resplendent wisdom of the Nur, they lose their power and are destroyed, just as the luminosities that glitter in the night sky disappear as soon as they encounter the resplendence of the sun. Manifesting in these two ways, the moon and sun confer their benefits, one to the earth body, the world, and the other to jnanam, wisdom. Similarly, if, like the sun, man's divine analytic wisdom were to resplend, and his divine luminous wisdom were to become resonant and effulgent, all the glitters belonging to the world of ignorance, the world of the darkness of illusion that is within Allah's creations, would be engulfed by that wisdom. Only the clarity of truth, which is the infinite, all-pervasive effulgence of God, would be evident within that wisdom. This we must realize with our wisdom. 
Further, my children, the sun and moon are positioned within this ball-like universe. Listen while I tell you about this universe. Within it are 15 worlds, and surrounding it is the ocean that is the grace, the rahmat of Allah, the lives that emerged from his power, and all of everything are resting on this grace. Seven of the 15 worlds are below, seven are above, and the dunya, the world in which we live, is in the middle. Allah's creations that have a form exist in this world. In it are things that the creations can learn about and experience through the clarity of their wisdom, as well as things they cannot experience, things that move and things that do not move, things that speak and things that do not speak, darkness and light, and also many countless millions of glittering objects. So that all of these might be understood, God created man, giving him a wisdom far superior to that of all other creations. There is a gradation in the levels of wisdom given to those other creations, but man, being endowed with divine analytic wisdom, is vastly superior to the rest of Allah's creations, for that wisdom is capable of knowing and understanding all of them. Thus, my children, we who are born as man must use that wisdom to investigate and understand. Now, the sun revolves, observing the ocean of Allah's grace. On that ocean, the world of souls and all of everything rest on a point finer than the sharp point of a needle, the point that is Allah's power, or kudrat. Like this point below, which it all rests upon, there is also a point above, the throne of Allah, the arsh. The sun of Allah's grace shines in the space between these two points, and within this space, the ball-like world called dunya is also revolving. As it rotates, one part of it is in the light of the sun, while the other is in the darkness caused by its own shadow. And as it continues to rotate, that shadow moves across the part that was earlier in the light. The alternating concealment of the world by that shadow results in what man calls day and night. Whenever the natural objects, which cannot be seen in daylight, enter the darkness cast by the shadow of the world, they begin to glitter. But as soon as the light reappears, all these things that glittered in the darkness fade and disappear. Man, according to the understanding of his wisdom, defines these phenomena as day and night and uses them to calculate his age from the day of his birth. But if he looks closely at the true plan of his life, he will see that it does not actually end until Kiyama, the day of reckoning. There is no death for him until the whole world and all of everything are destroyed and then appear once again. Therefore, the entire period of man's life is just one day. In that one day he appears in Awal, the dawn of creation, lives in Asr, the daytime, and dies at Maghrib, dusk. That day is his day of reckoning, when all of everything within him must die, be called to account, and be subjected to judgment. Until that day comes, his life does not end. It is like that for the sun, too. It will not disappear until that day of reckoning, nor will it appear again. Contrary to man's calculations, the sun does not set on one day and dawn on the next. On one day it appears, by the grace of Allah, observes and comprehends the world and all of everything, and sets when everything is subdued and comes to rest, the day of reckoning, Kiyama. But human beings, reckoning by their own calculations, assume that the sun is gone. They say, the sun has set, it is night. In the same way, they say, this man was born and now has died. They treat both in a similar manner. 
But man must realize, analyze, and look at such things with discriminative wisdom. Allahu Ta'ala Nayan formed all of everything out of the five elements, earth, fire, water, air, and ether. Using these five, he constructed all the universes, and within them he fashioned his many and varied creations. The five elements make up the outer form, but within that outer form is a subtle form, and still deeper within is a formless effulgence. The world is the outer form, the ball-like form made by the union of the five elements. The shadow cast by the world is a dark, subtle form, the darkness of illusion or maya. And deeper within that is the all-pervasive, infinite effulgence that is Allah, the one reality. Know this with wisdom. Similarly, the body of a human being is the outer form, a world made up of five components. The subtle form within it is a dark shadow form that belongs to the hypnotic torpor of illusion inherent in the part that is earth. And within that shadow image shines the resplendent effulgence of Allahu Ta'ala Nayan, that formless infinite oneness. This we must know and understand. Children, when the sun rises and begins to shine, the glitters from all the heavenly bodies fade and disappear, and only the sun's resplendence can now be seen. Like that, when the wisdom of the resplendence of the soul, the Atma Jyoti, becomes radiant, the world, which is form and illusion, which is the shadow image, dwindle and shrink, losing their power and their glitter, even though they remain exactly where they were before. We must reflect upon this. If in this rarest of births as human beings, the radiance that is the wisdom of the resplendent soul, which has the power of 10 million suns, begins to shine, the outer forms and the shadowy images glittering within those forms will fade and grow dim. However, just as the sun can be hidden by the earth, thus causing the appearance of night, man's intrinsic power can be hidden by the world and its shadow, the hypnotic and delusive darknesses of illusion. If, using the radiance of his wisdom, man removes the dark veils of his form and its shadow image, then the meaning of his birth will no longer be a mystery, and his soul will not die until the day of reckoning, nor will the sun disappear until that day. But just as those who do not see with the clarity of wisdom and with the resplendence of the effulgent soul may, from watching the sun, conclude that it is day in one place and night in another, there are those who, by using horoscopes and astrological calculations, attempt to explain man's emergence in this birth and to calculate and understand it in many different ways. The Kamal Sheikh explains how to understand a truth. The one called man attempts to know the world and its many sections by using the wisdom of his intellect in various ways. But as soon as he is conceived in this world, he is confined in a dark prison cell of his mother's womb, where he lives and grows for 10 months. For the next 10 months, lacking the understanding born of wisdom, he lives in silence in the prison of the cradle and his mother's lap. In the 10 months following that, he learns to talk chattering with his father, mother, and relatives in the way a parrot talks without knowing good or bad. In the succeeding 10 months, he lives in the prison of the nursemaid, the interim mother, who acquaints him with the meanings of father, mother, family, relatives, other people, his things, others' things, and the like. During this time, although he is unable to get around, he begins to learn a few things. After that, up to age 18, he is entangled in the prison of school, 
where he studies from books and acquires the knowledge needed to earn a living. After that, in order to fill his one-span stomach, he becomes entrapped in the prison of a job. Next, he becomes embroiled in the prison of sex and rolls around in the dark room of love and lust. Following that, he becomes entangled in the prison of children and the bondage of blood ties. Later, in the prison of old age, he is cursed and driven away by relatives, neighbors, and everyone else, and begins to roam here and there in fields, marketplaces, wayside shelters, and the like. After that, he falls into the hands of the angel of death, Israel, and reaches the prison of death. Finally, on the day of reckoning, according to the judgment of God, based on the fruits of his search during his lifetime, the balance of good and evil he has acquired, he will either be condemned to the prison of hell forever, or awarded the prison of heavenly bliss. In this way, prison entraps and confines these creations of God eleven times in their life in the world. But this world is such a vast expanse. The fifteen worlds also manifest as vast expanses, both within man and on the outside. What wonders these worlds contain! However, man fails to develop the wisdom that will enable him to discover these wonders. He even lacks the ability to realize his state of entrapment and torment during the eleven terms. And yet, relying solely upon what he has learned during those eleven prison terms, he thinks, all the things that shine in these fifteen worlds lie within the bounds of what I have learned. There is nothing beyond that. I have learned everything. Such talk is only the ignorant kind of understanding derived from false knowledge. Children, what we have learned amounts to but a handful of earth. What remains to be learned, however, is as vast as the universe. This is what the wise elders have said. Therefore, if you were to say, what I have learned is all there is to be learned, there is nothing more. I know what is true and what is false, what is good and what is bad. I am the greatest. Such statements would only point out the false knowledge that goes with the ignorance of your present birth, not the understanding of true wisdom. This you must realize. This place where the creations dwell is called the Eighth World. The earth of this world, Dunya, contains 80 quadrillion glitters. In it, there are many colors and magnetic forces. There are the nine kinds of precious gems, including rubies and diamonds. There are millions upon millions of metals, such as iron, lead, silver, and copper. There is oil, there is water, there is fire, there is air, there is electricity, there is delusion. Like this, there are countless varieties of wonders and subtle secrets glittering within the earth, but you have not been able to use the wisdom that is capable of examining that earth, this eighth world, and understand and know the wonders it contains. As long as you are in such a state, how can you possibly conclude that anything other than what you know is false? You must reflect seriously upon all these things the things that, from the confines of your various prison walls, you decided were false and unreal, if you look at it with such limitations, how can you possibly determine this is false and that is false? Only the things I have learned are true. Only one in whom wisdom has dawned, one who has come to know all the secrets of the earth, will understand those wonders. So it is equally inappropriate for you, at your present level of wisdom, to declare from whatever prison you are now in, that everything else is false. For example, if, for some reason or other, a man fell into a well and was swimming around in it, he would be able to assess the breadth and depth of only that well. He could not say, the ocean can't be any bigger than this. Anyone who says it can be is lying. 
Therefore, children, it is best for you to learn from one who knows. If instead you declare, this is false, that is false, only what I say is true, it simply shows lack of wisdom. Only if you get rid of this degraded state and make your true wisdom shine and use that wisdom to analyze earth, only then can you, who are earth, understand all the things that are concealed within you. Only in this state will you be able to see the earth world within you and comprehend what lies within it. Only then will you know yourself. It is this state the wise elders refer to when they say, to know yourself is to know God. Now I will tell you of the glory of the creation that is man and the rare and unique nature of that birth. Allahu Ta'ala Nayan compressed the 15 worlds and all of everything into the size of an atom within an atom. And within that atom, he compressed the secrets of the things he had already created and the things still to be created, the secrets of things that move and things that do not move, the secrets of things that speak and things that do not speak, the secrets of all of everything. And then he placed his secret, seer, his attributes, sifat, his essence, that, and his grace, all these, within the within of that atom. Then, so that these treasures would be discovered and realized, God formed the intention to create insan, or man, that rarest and highest of his creations. Toward this end, he wove together the 28 Arabic letters that constitute the Tiru Quran, or Tiru Marai, to constitute the form Surat of Insan. Of these letters, one was God himself, composed both of what he was like when he was in darkness in Anathi before Athi, and of his beauty, which shone resplendent as an infinite, omnipresent effulgence. The darkness that had been himself in Arwa, the divine realm, he formed into the fifteen worlds and formed those into this world, the dunya. The dunya he developed into the five elements. Then, with his resplendent light, the nur, he removed the antagonism that existed between those five elements, united them, and with them built the cage that is the body of Insan. Within that cage, he made the resplendent form of the letter that stood alone as himself, and he arranged the other 27 letters inside that cage, using five of them to form a space in the center. Within that space, the house made of the five letters, he placed all the things that had been created earlier, establishing the grace of his power as the six explanations within that space, house, made of five letters. He made 12 entrances to that cage, and then, to give it life, he blew into it the soul, which is one of the resplendent rays that showered forth from the nur, his hikmat. In order to make the body grow and move, he made use of earth, fire, water, and air, telling them, you will be the four signs, Razi, for this house. O oh, earth, if man who is created out of you comes to understand the four of you and then to know himself, he will know me. When he realizes me, he will disappear into my effulgence, and all four of you will perish and fall away from him. Thus did Allah explain in Anati, in the beginning. Therefore, my children, we who are born as man must realize and understand with the discriminative inquiry of our divine analytic wisdom. Who are we? Who is our creator? From what were we formed? Having understood these, 
we must learn with our wisdom about the earth from which we were formed and about the things that exist within the house made of that earth. Further, we should reflect upon the letters that constitute our form and understand the stars within it. My children, when you understand the form in this way, you will realize its subtlety. Let me describe the significance of this. Please reflect upon it. In the world, the 27 letters of this form can be seen as the 27 stars, as the 12 constellations or signs of the zodiac, whose energies are known as the astrological planets, as the five-lettered Panjangam, as the Panjat Charam, as the Panjad Charam, the symbol of the five letters, and as Ara Aridam, the six stations. They are also given many other astrological interpretations that are claimed to be useful in predicting one's fate and in understanding the good and bad effects and the sorrow and happiness in our lives. Similar explanations relating to man's body exist in the world, presuming to serve as horoscopes which investigate various aspects of birth and death, and thus allegedly help to preserve the well-being of the body. Man places faith in these explanations and blames the stars and planets for good and evil, birth and death, and happiness and sorrow, and goes around worrying about them. He interprets happiness as good and sorrow as bad. This seems to be the usual behavior in this world. Thus, man seeks to preserve his body by consulting his horoscope, the configuration of the stars, yet fails to realize that those same stars are right within his body, incorporated into its very structure. Children, let me explain this to you. Earlier, I mentioned the significance of the 28 letters. I also mentioned the beginningless beginning, Anati, and the time when God's power emerged, Ati. Did I not? The explanation for these two resides within man as a resplendent light that can dispel the darkness. You must understand them. They constitute one letter concealed within his form. That letter exists both as grace and as darkness. The darkness is the illusion of this world, while the grace is the effulgence of God. God used the other 27 letters to fashion the body of man. They resplend as 27 stars within that body. Twelve of these shine as the signs of the zodiac, which represent the 12 openings in the body of man. You must understand the good and evil and the hell and heaven that these twelve openings contain. Within this cage that is the body is the house of the five letters, Aleph, Lam, Mim, Ha, Dal, called the Panjangam. That is the heart. Please analyze and know these five letters. Once you understand this, it becomes the Panjacharam, the symbol of the five letters. You must also understand the five elements, earth, fire, water, air, and ether, which form the cage that is the physical body of man. Then you must dissect and analyze these six stations. The wisdom of divine knowledge, jnanam, which is divine luminous wisdom, per arivu, resonates explanations regarding the six levels of wisdom that form the consciousness within you. It is your sixth level of wisdom, divine analytic wisdom, together with the five levels of wisdom corresponding to the five senses, that manifest as six levels of consciousness, as six heads, and as six rays, within that which you call your body. Know this. Further, you must know whether your body, which is your horoscope, 
is an asset to you or a burden, if, with the wisdom of divine knowledge, jnanam, you ask that body, who are you? It will separate into four parts that will proclaim, I am earth, I am fire, I am water, I am air. You will see them opening their mouths from within you to boast of their powers as they display their prowess and conceit and caution you, saying, I, I, I. In that state, you must use your wisdom of divine knowledge, called jnanam, to realize, who am I? Where was I earlier? Further, when they boast about themselves, saying, I, I, with the vigor of arrogance, you must try to understand their qualities. You will see the actions that stem from those qualities, standing as four, displaying their pride with the frenzy of the arrogance of the eye. They are the four scriptures, the four signs, and the four steps. Four scriptures, the four corresponding religions. Arabic, Zabur, Hinduism, Jabarat, Hanal, or Zoroastrianism, worship of fire or lights, Injil, Christianity, Furqan, Islam, four signs, earth sign, fire sign, water sign, air sign, four steps, Tamil, Sarye, Kiriye, Yogam, Nyanam, Arabic, Shariat, Tarikat, Hakikat, Marifat. If we can understand how these, each of which is split into four sections, manifest as the twelve signs, the twenty-seven stars, the four religions, and the four steps, all of which combine into that which is the form of your birth, only then can we realize the excellence and the rareness of this birth as man. Then we will know the true horoscope of this form, and we will know who we are. In that state, we will realize that we are not this form, and we will know the answers to the questions. Who are we? Who is God? Where did we emerge from? Where will we go when we disappear? In this way, you will be able to realize the wonders of the land and the glory of the house you have occupied while here. Once you have realized this, you will be able to give back to its owner the rented house in which you have been living, and come to know with clarity how to return to and subside and settle back into that from which you emerged in the primal beginning. For you to discover, know, and comprehend this will be the liberation described in the horoscope of your birth as man. Realizing this, if you hand back all the things you borrowed to the one from whom you borrowed them, and make your way back to that place you were in earlier, that will be the ultimate fulfillment of your divine luminous wisdom. Children, there are many, many meanings to this. I have briefly described a few of them. This is the meaning of horoscope readings and of the planets that affect this human existence. If, with the radiant wisdom that is your Per Arivu, divine luminous wisdom, you can evaluate and know the horoscope of your body, discard all that is not truly you, Take only the treasure that is you, and, cutting away the dual feeling that says, you are different from me, if the kalk, you, the creation man, can lose itself within the hak, the reality, God, saying, you and I are one, that will be good. Please understand this. Only one who has understood and realized with clarity his horoscope, the secrets of his body, is capable of understanding God's truth, God's word, God's sayings, and God's books. Therefore, if such wisdom should resplend within you, 
it will be good for you to use that wisdom to analyze yourself. I most humbly beg this of you. Children, the wisdom of this state must be put to use and developed further. If this book is comprehended through that wisdom, then infinite bliss will be realized and experienced. That state will be the good path. The good path will be the path of right conduct, the path of God's qualities, and that will be the undiminishing wealth that rightfully belongs to man in this birth. It is essential that you and I understand this. Children, if there are any mistakes in this book, please forgive them and correct them yourselves with forbearance, sabur. Further, in the same way that you discovered these mistakes, please discover your own faults and correct them also. I ask this most humbly, in keeping with the qualities of Allah and his Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Children, the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has said, instead of correcting the faults of others, it is better to correct the faults in one's own heart. If we realize this, we can become true human beings. This is one thing that we and our fellow beings must understand. Amin, Ya Rabil Alamin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu kuluhu. May it be so, O Lord of the universes. May all the peace, the beneficence, and the blessings of God be upon you. We have translated this book to the best of our ability and to the extent of our wisdom. Those with more wisdom may have a deeper understanding of the truth within these pages. I don't know if you wanted to keep that last thing or not. Um, yeah, we can think about that either way. Okay. Yeah. Um, but one thing um, you, we do need to correct, which is a little bit, I have the same problem, but so it's actually Amin Ya Rabbal Alamin. Ah, okay. We're so used to uh, the way it is in the Fatiha, Rabbil Alamin, that um, I actually asked Rukaya about that. And, you know, it's just a different kind of construction of Arabic. So it, it kind of requires a little bit of remembering that it's not the way we're used to saying it. Oh, okay. I can go back and say that. Is yeah. there any difference in the meaning? Like, why is it different? No, no, no difference in the meaning. It's just, like I say, it's just a different grammatic structure. Um, okay. You know, uh, it's a feta instead of a kesra. And yeah, but the, okay. the meaning, the meaning is the same. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Amin, ya rabal alamin, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu kuluhu. May it be so, O Lord of the universes. May all the peace, the beneficence, and the blessings of God be upon you.